it's a new way of looking at things. And she's been here on campus for a long time. She's well published. She's a warrior for social justice and peace and justice issues. She's been part of the backbone of the Take Back Tonight. <laughs> Try to reduce violence against women. And she's just really a creative, energetic person. And if you get the chance to meet her, I urge you to take it. You won't be sorry. The latest thing she's looking into is women and the wilderness. Hello, everyone. My name is Sharon Barnes, and I'm delighted to be here with you for the University of Toledo's 26th annual Fan Books Vigil. Um, uh, this is my 25th year participating, and it is definitely one of my favorite events of the year. Um, I'm perhaps a little bit less happy to be talking about this subject beyond books and in trans. Uh, a topic that I've talked about a number of times over the years that I have participated. First, I want to say thank you to Paulette and the whole Van Books crew. Uh, every, year, every year you do an amazing job of putting this event together. And um, I especially want to say thank you to this year, to you all this year for allowing me to record uh, my presentation ahead of time uh, so that I could be with my sister who's having some uh, medical treatment today. Uh, thank you so much for enabling me to participate in the event virtually. I really appreciate it. Also want to make sure I say thank you to my colleagues in the Department of Women's and Gender Studies, uh, students, faculty, and staff there who have participated in this, allowed me to participate in this event over the years and have supported it over the many years. Thanks a lot to my, my home team, the Department of Women's and Gender Studies. I'd also like to take a moment to share with you the University of Toledo's land acknowledgement statement, which is the University of Toledo acknowledges that the region of Ohio in which the university sits is the ancestral homelands of the Seneca, Erie, and Modawa, as well as places of trade for indigenous peoples, including the Anishinaabe, Ojibwe, Potawatomi, Kalatika, Lenape, Kaskaskia, Kickapoo, Miami, Muncie, Peoria, Piankasha, Shawnee, Rhea, and Wyandotte. As a steward of public lands, it is our responsibility to understand the history of the land, the peoples who came before us, and their continuing ties to this place. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. Additionally, I'd like to recognize and acknowledge our dear colleague, recently retired Dr. Barbara Alice Mann. Um, of the many, many times I have said the words Ohio, I did not know for years that it meant beautiful river in the Seneca language. Um, Barbara gave this slide to me a few years ago with uh, permission to share it with you, uh, indicating some of the indigenous nations that are native here to Ohio. Uh, what you also see on the slide there are, are just a few of uh, titles of Barbara's many books. Uh, and I would emphasize the first one, Land of the Three Miamis, Northwest Ohio's Native American Traditions, as a book that's actually released by the University of Toledo Press uh, and uh, talks about the history of the land um, that we live, work, and play on here at UT. And I uh, highly recommend the book uh, as a a great orientation to that uh, phenomenon topic, as well as uh, just an acknowledgement of one of our many excellent professors we have here at UT. So thanks, thanks specifically to Barbara Mann for her work in recovering Indigenous history. Before I talk about the banning plan specifically, I uh, always like to do a little bit of background. And so apologies to those of you who have heard me present in the past, because this is something I talk about every year. And that is, what do we mean when we say a book is banned? Uh, I think the image uh, that you see on the left there of the books of flame, I think is what we typically think of uh, when we say books are banned. Uh, I think we have kind of a totalizing picture that a book might be banned everywhere in every library uh, all over the country. But in fact, the story is a little bit more complex than that. And I think that's to our benefit in the sense that 
Um, the American Library Association, uh, their Office for Intellectual Freedom, which is uh, the source of the statistics I'll be talking about more in this slide. Uh, they define um, two different sort of state statuses. One is a book that's challenged. And a challenge is an official request by a patron or someone to remove a book, remove or restrict a book. Uh, so sometimes they, instead of just pull the book off the shelf, they might pull it off the shelf and put it in, in a special uh, area that requires maybe parental permission to look at or somehow restrict its, its visibility or presence. Uh, so so the, the challenge is really just if someone asks this to happen, for this to happen. I don't, I don't like this book. I, I don't think the library should have it. Um, a banning is when a book is actually removed from the library shelves or restricted. And so there, those are really two different things. And of course, there are a lot more challenges than there are actual censorship occurrences. There's a process of review, it, uh, depending on the library, how that works. And so when we say a book is banned, what we're talking about is an actual removal of material. And, um, and this year, I think one of the reasons this event is so important is this year it's uh, the American Library Association documented 1,269 challenges. And that was the highest number of challenges ever since they started looking at data, and that was uh, more than 20 years ago. Um, it's almost double what, what was challenged last year. And uh, this year, there were also a record 2,571 unique titles um, that were challenged, um, and that's up 38% from last year. The reason there are so many more challenges than there are, uh, or I mean, so many more individual titles than challenges because there are sometimes multiple books challenged at once. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this year, in fact, there was a huge increase in multiple challenges. Typically, historically, there would be one person challenging a material book or the other. You know, but, uh, but this year, people were challenging, people and organizations were challenging numbers of books. Incredibly, in some cases, 90% um, were multiple censor, censorship opportunities. And 40% of those, I shouldn't say opportunities, incidences, 40% uh, of those were challenging more than 100 books. So whole lists of books were challenged. Uh, and that's a, that, that, as I said, is a in recent phenomenon. Uh, what is challenged? Well, overwhelmingly, 82% uh, this past year, it's books that are challenged. Other things that are challenged would be displays, that's 6% this year, then, you know, setups in the library featuring certain materials, and then other kinds of things, even including programming. I mentioned in previous presentations that drag queen uh, story hours were, or have been very popular and they have been frequent new targets of censorship. So uh, there are lots of kinds of materials that are challenged, but overwhelmingly it's books. Um, who does the challenging? Uh, you probably would be not surprised to know that mostly it's parents. That would be 30% of the challenges this year. 28% would just be a patron of the library. Someone came in and challenged the book, didn't like it. Uh, this year, 17% of the challenges were by political or religious organizations. And I don't remember that being identified in the past, so Paula Alta or somebody else on the committee, I'll have to leave it to you to, to see if we've seen political or religious organizations in the past. 15% um, um, boards or administrations like school boards or probably maybe even library boards, 3% librarians uh, or teachers, and 3% elected officials. In terms of where books are challenged, uh, the, the largest place, uh, largest library or entity that challenges folks would be school libraries. Um, and that would be 58% of the time. It could be also not the library itself, but a classroom, like where an entire class was assigned to read a book and then someone challenged the book in the classroom. 41% um, of the challenges happened in public libraries. 
And I read an article in the New York Times recently saying that that's actually becoming a much more popular venue, so we're seeing more increases uh, or increases in challenges at public libraries. Um, happy to say that university libraries are responsible for only one percent of challenges. Very rare uh, to be challenged at a university library, and I think that's a testament to our. Uh, desire for people to have access to material to decide for themselves what they want and don't want to read, and we really appreciate that. In terms of the why books are challenged, um, all kind of reasons. Uh, you probably will not be surprised to know that a very significant reason is LGBTQ content. Uh, six of the top ten, um, or eleven, because it was a tie for ten. Uh, books this year are, are more challenged for LGBTQ content, and two top books uh, were challenged for that reason. Uh, other reasons that you would see would be selective, sexually, um, not sex, uh, sexual explicitness or um, sexual content, you know, not appropriate for the age group, uh, also profanity, violence, um, racism. Uh, racial stereotyping, uh, and I do think it's worth mentioning there in terms of um, the who challenges. Uh, books are challenged on the left and the right uh, for different reasons, political left and right. So um, books are challenges, challenged for all sorts of reasons, but uh, in the many years that I've been doing uh, this program, I've uh, really focused on children's books for probably the last, last 15 years, and even ones that are not uh, Said, saying that they're challenging for LGBTQ content, you know, they say they're sexually explicit, but the sex that they're explicitly challenging, the explicit sex that they're challenging is queer sex, uh, not heterosexual sex. So I would argue probably a lot more of them are uh, challenged for queer content than we know. And the other point I would make here uh, is that, I mean, in terms of the how many, I think that. Uh, what's true is that this is the official formal complaints that are filed with the ALA, and what's also true is that a lot of censorship happens uh, that's not reported, uh, and a lot of self-censorship happens. I mean, I always say, you know, librarians are courageous and ferocious about protecting our right to access to information, but what's true is that like a teacher may just decide that that uh, bad book's too controversial, I'm not going to order it, I don't want to get attacked on the internet or, you know, drag through the mud, uh, so I'm just not going to bother to do it. And um, so I think there's probably a lot more censorship than these numbers indicate. One thing I think it's important to talk about in talking about this topic is to look at the context in which um, we're experiencing these bans on the material as well as trans, I would say, healthcare and identity. Uh, and part of the context is the incredible increase in visibility and social acceptance for LGBTQ people, and particularly trans visibility in the last 10 years or so. We've just had an incredibly um, profound cultural shift in terms of visibility and acceptance of, of queer life. Uh, and um, as a consequence, or, or at least in part of, of a consequence of that, is that we also, as it often happens, we have experienced a backlash. Uh, and certainly the 2016 election um, and the rise of modern conservatism has really demonstrated the um, backlash, particularly for LGBTQ people. Perhaps LGBTQ people are the target, an easy target for conservative backlash. So um, the numbers I'm going to talk about uh, come from the uh, Pen America, which is a group dedicated to the freedom of speech, freedom of um, uh, it's freedom to write. Really, but it's, it's a group of writers, fiction, nonfiction, poets, etc., who really um, do a lot of awareness around our. Um, freedom of expression, and they've um, done some research about what they call educational gag orders. And so um, last year, in 20, or the last previous year, 2021, research said um, 24 different legislatures uh, introduced 54 different bills and uh, to prohibit uh, teaching of divisive topics, uh, to, to address racism, um, or other uh, topics that some people might find offensive, uh, in Ohio, they call it divisive topics, and that we have one here in Ohio also. 
Uh, and so uh, now there are something like 80, 87 uh, in, in every single state, and that's the, uh, the image there on of this, the, the nation on the left. I forgot to mention in terms of where books are challenged, the state of Texas was the top of the challenger last year. And you can see there are the ones that actually have uh, state laws uh, uh, prohibiting teaching of certain things. And as, as uh, Ken would say, these are the avalanche. These are absolute restrictions on the freedom to teach, to think, to, and certainly to read. Uh, so I think that's part of the context. Certainly the Florida Don't Say Gay Bill, which I talked about last year, <clears throat> for teachers from talking about LGBTQ topics, um, which they already had a bill, but, but uh, again, uh, targeting the community and sharing information about the community is, I think, the context for which we now are looking at banning trans material as well as trans health care. I don't think I can not share that uh, the top two texts this year both deal with trans or and or non-binary material. Gender queer is a memoir about a gender queer person, as is All Boys Aren't Blue, the top two books challenged in 2022. Um, they weren't only challenged for LGBTQ content, but also sexually explicit, et cetera. So they're not always, as I said earlier, it's not always about, uh, uh, they don't always tell us what it's about. I think one of the most upsetting elements of this topic uh, beyond the banning of individual materials, books, et cetera, is um, what is I, what, it, what I see as an extension of that, which is bills that ban trans uh, identity, trans access to healthcare, trans personal exp expression. And I think that uh, this really does affect trans people's ability to live their lives as free citizens of this country. Um, one of the things that I put here on the slide, this is provided by translegislation.com. Uh, last year, there were, uh, in 2022, there were 174 bills targeting some aspect of trans identity or experience, and 26 of those bills passed into law. This year, uh, as you can see on the right, um, 568 bills have been introduced in all 49 states. So if we were looking at that map this year, it would be pretty much all of them. Uh, 83 have passed and 360 are still active. Uh, I think this, this is an alarming um, number of bills and it is a significant and serious attack on trans liberty. And I think and hope that everyone would be concerned about that regardless of your personal gender expression or identity. Um, the bills cover a variety of topics. Probably number one is healthcare, uh, banning gender affirming healthcare. And um, uh, in some cases, uh, you know, what you might expect is prohibiting um, hormone blockers for adolescents, um, uh, which I think is interesting. If you go back to the first slide that I showed, which is about parents' rights, you know, this is sort of taking away parents' rights to decide with and for their children about what's best for their health care. But uh, some of the bills go well beyond that to prohibit uh, trans care into adulthood so that trans affirming, gender affirming care is not available even for adult, uh, adults like up to age 26, I think the highest is. Um, and then other states now are, um, I think the first one was Alabama, uh, imposing criminal um, penalties on doctors and other medical personnel who provide gender affirming health care. So, so beyond the ban, we now are getting uh, felony charges for folks who are, are uh, performing that health care. Um, other kinds of legislation would be uh, drag bans. And, you know, this would be uh, banning people from uh, wearing the clothing of the so-called opposite sex or opposite gender and you know, feminists have been saying forever that gender gender is a social construction and um, changes over time and no one gender uh, owns 
of, of any article of clothing, so impossible to, to um, enforce when we consider uh, this sort of binary construction of gender uh, as opposed to something perhaps more fluid and more spectrum in nature. So um, banning drag, banning drag shows. And then um, another really important aspect would be um, the targeting documents like health uh, um, sports driver's license or certificates preventing people from matching their documents to the name, which can be quite dangerous for trans people because they, um, especially track, if they, their documents don't match, they can, they can incur significant penalties or harm. Just quickly, and I, this is a, really the last slide, and it's a, again from Pan America, and they just talk about the educational specifically, that they really are the opposite of what they claim to be. I think a lot of these bills have, you know, Protect Kids Act and the Parents' Rights Act and things like that, and, and, and they're not uh, safeguarding American extreme values. They, they really do um, show uh, censorship. Uh, and um, as Penn says, they use the machinery of government to silence the speech of those with whom they disagree. And I think, regardless of what your personal feelings are about gender or transgender people specifically, uh, I would like to encourage all Americans to support people's right to access to information, access to health care. Uh, those are foundational rights in our country. Uh, thank you. I'm going to drag a lot on in person to answer any questions or take any comments. Um, but I may, I'm anticipating that I may struggle with that a little bit. So I just wanted to say, I hope uh, you enjoyed the presentation. And if you have comments or questions, I'm sure folks in the room will be happy to give you some air time for that. Thanks a lot for your attention. And thanks again for the wonderful screen. Okay, Sharon is ready for a, a Q&A live. So we'll start with are there any questions to uh, Dr. Barnes? There's a microphone here. Yeah. So, any questions for Dr. Barnes? Is that one over here? I'm going to try to type the question into the chat, also. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Can, can you hear her? Can you hear me? So and so. Okay. It's quite quiet on her side. Okay, I just want to make sure. Um, so in terms of you were talking about challenges and a number of challenges. Um, are those are those challenges for different books or is that the number in total? Like for repeat titles? The, the number of challenges that I shared with you in the slideshow uh, is the total number. And so the, the number of challenges is smaller than the total number of books because some people challenge multiple titles at the same time. As I was saying, some the organizations, uh, some of them are charging or challenging more than 100 titles at once. So they're, they're doing a formal written challenge, but it's not just one person challenging one book, they're challenging a whole list of books all at once. So that represents the total number of challenges. Okay, thank you. All right, who else would like to comment or ask a question? Do we have anybody else? Any other questions? In the back, I'm coming. Not as fast as I was 26 years ago. I really hated to miss all the cheers this year, and I know I missed some good jokes too today. <laughs> um, I wondered how you felt about the kind of challenges that happen when literature from the past that may have um, older stereotypes about um, groups of folks are challenged today, you know, for like a poor representation, like the Dr. Seuss one a, a little bit ago, 
it seems like in a way that's a good thing. Like, oh, we, we don't want to portray a, a group in a in a bad way, even if it was written so long ago. And yet at the same time, that's kind of censorship too. And so it's hard to know how to what the right answer is. What do you think? Thank you for that question. Um, as I stated in the talk, uh, books are challenged from the political right and the political left, and you're absolutely right about um, how they would be challenged from the political left is usually about especially racial stereotypes. Uh, and, uh, so, I, and even like Huck Finn has been challenged a lot for that, you know, a classic texts, lots of classic texts have been challenged, Toni Morrison's work, Alice Walker. Um, so I think the the free speech uh, purist says it's nobody's right to tell somebody else what they can read or can't read. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's my position in the sense that I don't think schools should be in the position of um, deciding what's appropriate or not appropriate. Um, I, I would hope that a teacher or a school district wouldn't select like, you know, the third grade reading book to be some ancient, you know, racist text. I think that would be grossly inappropriate, <laughs> but, um, I, I don't think we should, um, you know, my personal feelings are, you know, there are lots of things I don't think people should read and share, but I also think that, uh, if we value the right of access to material, then we value all material and hopefully provide people tools to uh, interpret racial stereotypes or sexist stereotypes and to critically look at the material that they're reading and, um, you know, make judgments about it. But I think that's where if a teacher is choosing a sexist or racist book, I, I think parents have a right to challenge if they're being forced, if their children are being forced to read those kinds of materials. And I, I'm sure that is what some of the challenges are about, but I guess I come down on the side of um, autonomy for people to decide what's appropriate for them or not. What do you think? Um, I agree. Um... I think context has to be, I guess, given. I mean, To Kill a Mockingbird, for example, is a classic novel that's also very, you know, racist. But, you know, it's a great book and you can learn a lot from it. And if you can contextualize the time and what happened there, um, I think as long as um, that's being done, um, obviously, it's it's a learning uh, experience for anyone who reads that book. That's a great point. I I also think that what's true is um, if we look at the materials that are being challenged, I think the challenges are way more likely to be about sexuality or sexual sexual or gender identity than than fear and concern about racism. I wish <laughs> I wish it were the other way around, but I don't think that it is. Thank you, Sharon. 